Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Claire, what is Celebrity Memoir Book Club? Just two chatty broads chatting their little mouths out, talking out their buttholes, (laughs) (laughs) saying what they think and thinking what they say. Shattering our little faces off until our teeth fall out like Matthew Perry's. That's so true. You guys are about to hear that too. We do it all to protect your teeth. Yes, because we are the enamel and our thoughts are the cavities that are caused by enamel. Yeah. Anyway, if you guys love it, please leave us a five-star review. Ashley thanks all of our five-star reviewers. I think we're going to have to do an international edition soon. We're going to have to do like a mega read where we start doing it by continent. And then if you don't like it, as always, floss yourself out. We'll catch you on the flip-flop. Before we even get into this episode, I have a call to action for my little wormies. As you guys know, we are huge marathon fans. This weekend is the (gasps) marathon. If you are a wormy running the New York City Marathon, I'm going to put a question box on our Instagram so you can submit your bib numbers, but you need to send us your bib numbers so we can scream at your heads when you run by. Yeah, we'll track you. We love it. We'll be, um, I guess I'm about to dox my own ass. (laughs) We'll be on 8th and Bedford, North 8th and Bedford. And please don't murder me. Eh, Whatever. Anyway, send us those numbers. I'm so excited to support you. For the wormies who were at Boston on Thursday... We are recording just minutes before leaving, and I don't know how it's going to go, but I imagine amazing. I can't wait to see you. Thank you so much for coming. We'll formally thank you a week later once we know how fun it was. But you know us. We would never lie to your little worm faces. One other announcement. This is the last week to buy our current era of merch. We are launching some new stuff coming up quite soon. So that's going to be gone and dusted after this week. And... Thank you to Newly for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Go to newly.com and enter the code WORM20 for $20 off your first month of clothing rental. That's N-U-U-L-Y.com and use the code WORM20. And thanks to Bull & Branch for supporting our show. Bull & Branch sheets are made from the finest 100% organic cotton threads on earth. They make a difference you can truly feel night after night. For a limited time, get 20% off your first set of sheets and free shipping when you use the promo code WORM at bowlandbranch.com. Claire, if you were to write a memoir this week, how soft or not soft would it be? Okay, that doesn't make sense to me (laughs) as like a way to describe my week. Here's my twofold. This week is save the date drama because I have been trying to DIY stuff, but something cute about me is I just figure it out as I go. And by figure it out, I mean I pay for it to be wrong maybe 12 to 18 times before it works out. So in this attempt to do what presumably should have cost me almost no money, which is these save the dates, I have now spent like hundreds of dollars getting it wrong and printing out thousands of wrong ones. And I have had problems with deliveries from Michael's. I went to Michael's. I bought it. It was the wrong shape. I got it printed out from FedEx. It turns out I couldn't even print on the things I had bought and shipped from Michael's. And then I had to get them printed at FedEx and then I cut them the wrong size. So then I had to get them reprinted. I went to three different FedExes this week to get it printed out. I'm finally done. And the most shocking thing in all of it is I continue to learn about my fiance. And this week's shocker was that he doesn't know a goddamn thing about mail. Some of the things you've texted me this week. I studied mail multiple times in school. I think in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and eighth grade, we had entire (laughs) mail segments. He has asked me, I was talking about the stamps we had to get. And he goes, well, do you even need stamps to mail something? I was like... What does he, does he just think stamps are decoration? I don't know if he thinks you can go to the mail store and like pay per mail with a credit card. And then we were writing him out and he like didn't know where the to went and he didn't know where the from went. He's like, well, why do we have to even put our address on it? And I was like, so they know where it's coming from. And then yesterday he was watching me put stamps on and he goes, they always have to go in that one corner. And I was like, so you've never seen a piece of mail. <laughs> you couldn't draw a piece of mail from memory cartoon style. <laughs> Love him to death. There's a lot of things I don't know that he knows, but that is an interesting glaring hole in knowledge. If I could go back in time... There is not a single thing about history that I would change because butterfly effect, baby, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I would go back in time to one and a half weeks ago and I would hand Mac an envelope and say, <laughs> do what you think makes sense. I just want to see it. Yeah, if this had been August 2022 and you said this check must go in the mail, then what? I want to hand him a piece of paper and say, get this to Chicago. He would have said my friend Ashley goes all the time for weddings. She'll drop it off for me. He would have given it to Bug and been like, you know the pigeons. Find out which one of them's flying south. So this is fun. I don't know. I just feel like everybody always says like, oh, planning a wedding, you learn so much about your partner or whatever. And I've been living with him for two years. I'm like, what's left to learn? And I'm like, oh my God. He's learning. I'm learning that he's learning. A lot of education is happening. Beautiful. Ashley. Yeah. If you were a celebrity, what would this week's chapter of your memoir be called? This week's chapter would be called uh, Dark Mode. 
Uh oh. I went off the grid. I don't, what's it called when your phone's off? Off. (laughs) (laughs) That's the word you're looking for, off? I guess. I was in a real hurry to run several errands and they were quite time sensitive. So I didn't have time to make sure my phone had any proper charge before I walked out of the house. And then it turned out it was at 7%. And I had to be in touch with someone that I was picking up this book from. And so I was making sure I like saved all the juice I had to text her so that we could meet up. And I was just bopping about the city, no phone. My phone died as soon as I texted, I'm in the lobby. I was just looking around. I chatted to a security guard for a while. Oh my God, you've really got to know people. Like I wasn't doing directions or anything. I was meeting her in a pretty well-known building. And so I got out of the train and I had to look to the sky to be like, where's the building? Because I didn't have enough juice for maps. It was just an adventure that I honestly would love to do more often. Maybe I should just start going dark mode every couple of weeks for an hour or two. Spend a couple hours a week not on my phone. It could be like a fun thing. I don't know. I had like a really fun afternoon. And like sometimes I get stressed out when I have so many things to accomplish in a short amount of time. And then I was like, this is a good time, though. Ashley. Yes, Claire. Should we get into this week's memoirs? If we have to. I have two things up top. One is that I did see this man, Matthew Perry. You may know him as Chandler Bing from Friends on Raya a few years ago. Interesting. His bio stated that he was not looking for Instagram models. He was looking for funny, real, down-to-earth women. And I remember saying yes, just to see. And he did not match with me. And my question was, what the hell, Matthew Perry? Was I too beautiful for you? (laughs) Because I remember being like, okay, so you're a fucking liar. Because I'm funny and not an Instagram model. And if that's what you're looking for, then look no further. I was 25 at the time. And I had put my age limit all the way to the top just to kind of see what celebrities are on there. Yeah, Because the older you go the closer to an A-lister you'd get because an old loser even if he's Bruce Willis will get on there do you know what I mean wasn't Ben Affleck on there for a while before he (gasps) married J-Lo don't tell me that (laughs) I'll reactivate tomorrow well now he's married what does that mean to Ben Affleck I'm pretty sure he was don't quote me on it ask Demois anyway my larger point was I found it a bit laughable that this man whose number one thing was I don't want to date an Instagram model had his age limit set down to 25 and I'm like okay so not a model but just a youthful youthfully a funny. youthful four maybe he just <laughs> likes the kind of humor that comes with youth he's like listen I would love to date a woman my own age but I'm addicted to memes <laughs> that's not true he was addicted to opioids anyway by the way trigger warning this episode is mostly about addiction so that's thing one thing two is as Ashley just said this is a book about an addiction and I think he wrote honestly from his experience. And I think he really revealed who he is at his core. Ashley and I did not love who he was at his core. If you open this book looking for a friend, just because he was on Friends doesn't mean he's ours. I think it's an interesting book. I think it's a real book that like cut up in a vein and let it bleed on the page. But his blood is a bit tangy. (laughs) As a vampire, I said... Not my type. We're going to get into it. We obviously want to try to be as sensitive and nuanced as possible. I mean, he has a horrible disease that is addiction and is not his fault. There are some things that I think were much in his control, like the way he talks about women and the way he talks about other people and who he blames for everything in his life and the way he like continues to call himself a child, even up to the age of 50. Two. 52. I was like, this might be your fault. But anyway, we're going to get into it. But that's just kind of like a trigger warning. This book is mostly about addiction. And if you do not have space in your heart and your brain to see people as multifaceted and you want to see someone as either a victim of a terrible disease. If there's no room for someone who suffered with something bad but also kind of sucks, then this probably isn't the episode for you. I know that you guys hear us shit on people all the time, but I think this is probably the most hotly anticipated memoir we've had since Jeanette McCurdy. Jeanette really came through. She wrote a great story and I think was a person that we really liked and felt was vulnerable and honest and trying hard. This was trying hard. It was trying something. Anyway, the foreword is by Lisa Kudrow, who can't even think of anything nice to say. Lisa Kudrow writes a foreword where she says, Matthew asked me to write this foreword. Also, people always ask me how he's doing. The answer is, I hope well. I'm not really sure, but good for him if he's still alive. She literally says he has survived impossible odds but I had no idea how many times he almost didn't make it. I'm glad you're here, Maddie. Good for you. I love you. Oh, you're alive? Good. (laughs) Good for you, buddy. Let me tell you, first and foremost, I am a Lisa Kudrow diehard. I love Lisa Kudrow. If there's one person in the industry I think I could have lunch with, it would be Lisa Kudrow. Lisa? If you're listening. So followed by the foreword, we have a prologue. So part of this book is that it was not meant to be read. It was meant to be spoken by a man 
in the shadows of an alleyway with a cigarette coming out of his mouth saying, hey kid, you wanna hear a story? <laughs> I've lived a life, son. Hi, my name is Matthew, although you may know me by another name. My friends call me Maddie. And I should be dead. Bum, bum, bum. Sorry, that's insensitive. He should be dead. So he suffered severe backup in his intestines. His colon fully exploded while he was in the throes of recovery. I hadn't taken a shit in 10 days. There, there's the drift. Something was wrong, very wrong. This is not a dull throbbing pain like a headache. It wasn't even a piercing stabbing pain. This was a different kind of pain, like my body was going to burst. It was the platonic ideal of pain. I've heard people claim that the worst pain is childbirth. Well, this was the worst pain imaginable, but without the joy of a newborn baby in my arms at the end of it. You'll see throughout this book, he does not talk in a way that I find respectful about women. And so for him at the very beginning of the book to be like, the worst pain is a woman's pain. No. No, because <laughs> I am in pain and I don't even get a baby at the end of it. At least your body gets torn to shreds and then you have a baby. My pain, all I had was a pile of poos. So he explains that my mind is out to kill me and I know it. I am constantly filled with a lurking loneliness, a yearning, clinging to the notion that something outside of me will fix me. But I had had all the outside had to offer. Julie Roberts is my girlfriend. It doesn't matter. You have to drink. I just bought my dream house. It looks across the whole city. Can't enjoy that without a drug dealer. I'm making a million dollars a week. I win, right? Would you like to drink? Why, yes, I would. Thank you very much. I had it all, but it was a trick. Nothing was going to fix this. I don't write this so that anyone will feel sorry for me. I write these words because they are true. I write them because someone else may be confused by the fact that they know they should stop drinking. Like me, they have all the information and they understand the consequences, but they still can't stop drinking. You are not alone, my brothers and sisters. In the dictionary, under the word addict, there should be a picture of me looking around very confused. I also want to say, I find this book, I would not recommend it, I don't think, to an addict. I've never dealt with addiction, and I think that this is a really interesting book for, I think, maybe someone who knows addicts. But I find that this book has how-tos in it, which I don't think is good. He then explains that at this point, he's living in a sober house in Southern California in a room that he shares with his assistant best friend, Erin, a lesbian whose friendship I treasure because it brings me the joy of female companionship without the romantic tension that has seemed to ruin my friendships with straight women. If there is ever the chance that he could fuck someone, he cannot be friends with them. Not to mention, we can talk about hot women together. He had met her in another rehab and then brought her over as his assistant and best friend and therapist, which as we all know is so healthy. So this is the situation and he's in a ton of pain. He's in the sober living house. The nurses on staff don't really believe that he's in pain. They think he's doing it to try to get drugs. Which he has done in the past and does do again in the future. Luckily, his assistant believes him. His assistant is essentially like, trust me, he's not this good at acting. They get there and immediately they're like, your colon's about to explode. They get him to an emergency surgery. He gets pneumonia. They put him on an ECMO, which is like a breathing thing that four people were on in California at the time. And the other four people all died. It is very last minute, very dire. He is in a coma for the next 12 days. Yeah. When he wakes up, he has no idea what has happened but he has an ostomy bag. He has 50 machines hooked up to him. It turns out there was a fissure in his intestines. So he's not allowed to eat or drink except for by IV until they figure it oh, out. A fistula. A fistula, sorry. He spends the next five months in the hospital recovering from this and has to go on to get 14 more surgeries just to undo a lot of the damage that was done in the first attempt at saving his life. After five very long months, I was released. I was told that within the year, everything inside me would heal enough so that I could have a second surgery to reverse the colostomy bag. But for now, we packed my overnight bags, five months of overnights, and we made the voyage home. Also, I'm Batman. He has this thread, I want to say throughout, but really at the beginning and maybe one point in the middle and the end where he calls himself Batman. I don't know what it's about, really. So he gets out of the hospital and I can't help but ask myself the overwhelming question, why? Why am I alive? I have a hint of the answer, but it's not fully formed yet. It's in the vicinity of helping people. I know that, but I don't know how. The best thing about me, bar none, is that if fellow alcoholics come up to me and ask me if I can help them stop drinking, I can say yes and actually follow up and do it. You can't give away something that you do not have. And most of the time I have these nagging thoughts. I'm not enough. I don't matter. I'm too needy. So he backs it up to his childhood and sort of these moments that he thinks led him to this place where he's not enough, this fear of abandonment. This book is back and forth, occasionally, effectively, occasionally. You're just like, what year is it? He's artistically bringing you to where he was when he woke up from that coma and he thought, <laughs> what year is it? The chapters mostly go in chronological order with interludes that are like random memories, random present moments. But then sometimes he will just fully break that order 
and be like in 2011 and then 2004, but he never gives you the year. Yeah. So it's a bit confusing. And sometimes he'll use like a project he was working on at the time as the touchstone for what year it was. So you have to be like very aware of the chronology of his work. <laughs> yeah, you're like, when was Mr. Sunshine? When was Studio 60 on Sunset Strip? Again, it comes back to this problem that he's not enough. And it starts with his core wound is that when he was five years old, he was an unaccompanied minor on a flight. So his parents got divorced when he was nine months old and he didn't see his dad that much. He was living in Canada with his mom, who's Canadian, and his dad lived in Los Angeles. So I guess they would just throw him on a plane, and that was very traumatic for him. Not having a parent on that flight is one of the many things that led to a lifelong feeling of abandonment. If I'd been enough, they wouldn't have left me unaccompanied, right? Isn't that how all this was supposed to work? The other kids had parents with them. I had a sign in a magazine. It was the 70s. They had a system on the plane where it's like, oh, we'll watch your kid. Where could he go? He's sitting. Like you walk your kid to the gate. That was when you could walk people to gates. Yeah. Throw him on the plane. Someone else meets him at the next gate. Where is he going to go from inside of the plane? But I guess he was scared. So that's his core wound is that he felt abandoned because he was an unaccompanied minor and going from parent to parent. His dad was a musician. His dad's band actually had like a top six billboard hit at one point. His mom was a Canadian pageant queen and by that I mean she won a pageant when she was in college they met at the pageant they dated for two years she got pregnant at 20 had the baby at 21 and was back in Canada with her parents and they had slid up by the time she was 21 and Matthew was nine months old so he talks about the feeling of his dad dropping them off at the U.S. Canada border and driving away and him wondering when his dad was going to come home and it's like at nine months old you were wondering day two I wondered is dad coming home today like was that real (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. He's like, you know, and then my mom would say he's coming home soon and she was lying. I'm like, it's really weird to project a lie onto your mom. I know that she did not say that to you. You were nine months old. Maybe there was like a feeling of absence, but I don't think your mom would have had the wherewithal to be like, I have to craft some sort of tale for this kid. (laughs) Then he gets to sort of the formation of his personality. With dad gone, I quickly understood that I had a role to play at home. My job was to entertain, to cajole, to delight, to make others laugh, to soothe, to please, to be the fool to the entire court. There I was already, the performer, the people pleaser. His mom was basically Alice and Jenny from the West Wing, a spinmeister. She was the press secretary for Pierre Trudeau, who was then the Canadian prime minister and General Gallivanter. So apparently his mom was very beautiful. Of course, she was a pageant queen and she was like the PR person for this guy. And so she had this really impressive high up job, but it was incredibly demanding. Like everywhere he went, she had to go. She was always on Pierre Trudeau's side. I don't know if it's supposed to be implied that they were kind of hooking up. Yeah, he makes it sound like they might have been. I guess Pierre Trudeau was a real womanizer, but he says that means that his mom had a lot of work cut out for her where she was always explaining it. He says that at one point when they were kids, he beat up Justin Trudeau. Just a little fun tidbit there. He has like a lot of resentment towards the Canadian government for being more important to his mom than he is. <laughs> yeah. Which is just like a funny object of your anger. He talks about a time when he and his mom spent the entire day together just like hanging out. And then that night they were curled up watching a movie and... His mom got a work call and, of course, had to go in the other room and handle some work stuff. It's like his worst memory ever that all he'd got was a full day with his mom. And then at night, can you believe a phone call? I've always been abandoned so much so that I used to ask my grandmother when a plane went over our house in Ottawa. Is my mother on that plane? Because I was always worried that she would disappear just as my father had. She never did. My mother is beautiful. She's a star in every room she entered. And she's certainly the reason I'm funny. He says he and his mom had a very hot head back and forth relationship. They were both very quick witted and temperamental, I guess. So he says they would just like scream at each other. (laughs) His dad, on the other hand, gave up his music career and became an actor and would eventually become the old spice guy. Cool. He was perfect. And even at that age, I liked things I could not have. He really loves his dad. His dad is charismatic, funny, charming, hyper handsome. He was also a nationally ranked tennis player. That was a big deal to him. But he was like bad at school. Yeah, but he was the lead in every play. So he was, you know, I think he was very passionate, very intense. He wanted to be good at what he wanted to be good at. He wanted to get people's attention. He was a cut up. He didn't do his homework. Then he's 15 years old. He's with some friends. They try alcohol for the first time. These are still the two friends that he considers his best friends to this day. I don't know how often he sees them. I don't think it's often, but I also don't think he sees that many people ever. Yeah. He talks about having a drink for the first time and they puked. And of course they were sick all over the grass, but I was laying back in the grass in the mud, looking at the moon surrounded by fresh Murray puke. And I realized for the first time in my life, nothing bothered me. The world made sense. It wasn't bent and crazy. I was complete at peace. I had never been happier than in that moment. So then he talks about kind of the nature of addiction and how he's surprised that in that moment he didn't start seeking out alcohol every moment, but it was just like a wonderful night and a wonderful memory. 
He says he still would never go back and change that night, but he says the key problem I would come to understand was this. I lacked both the spiritual guidelines and an ability to enjoy anything, but at the same time, I was also an excitement addict. This was such a toxic combination, I can't even. I guess looking back on this night, he's sort of discovering the nature of his addiction. I honestly don't know. He has some of these broad analyses of his psyche that to me don't really land on anything. Yeah, sometimes he really likes to wax poetic and just like write these Caroline Calloway-esque sentences. I don't know. He's been to a lot of therapy and you can see it, but I don't know if you can feel it. Things at home just got worse and worse. My mom had a wonderful new family with Keith. Emily arrived and she was blonde and cute as a button. And just like Caitlin, I loved her instantly. However, I was so often on the outside looking in. Still that kid up in the clouds on a flight to somewhere else unaccompanied. Mom and I were fighting all the time. Tennis was the only place I was happy. And even then I was angry or sobbing even when I won. Oh yeah, just to back it up, his mom gets married to Keith Morrison from Dateline. She herself is a very like successful person, I think, in the Canadian view. I think if you were an adult when she was an adult in Canada, you would have known who she was. So when he's 15, he decides to go and live with his dad. A lot of it comes from the fact that him and his mom are just screaming at each other all the time. In Canada, I was angry, sobbing and drinking and me and my mom were fighting and I wasn't a full part of the family and I sucked at school and who knew if I was going to have to move soon anyway. And damn it, a kid wants to know his father. So he decides to go. His parents are kind of like, okay, fine. Maybe it'll be better for your tennis career there anyway. And he leaves. He says, I was breaking their hearts by leaving, but I had no choice. Things had gotten so bad. I was a broken human being, broken, bent. Like he really does feel by 15 years old, this is his lot in life. Still an unaccompanied minor, but a pro by now. I flew to LA to get to know my father. I mean, the night he leaves, his mom and his grandparents, they all live together, are like begging him not to go. But he's like, I have to go. And of course, as soon as he gets to LA, it turns out that everyone in LA is much better at tennis. Like the tennis stream is gone the minute he lands. Yeah, but he does mention several times that the reason everyone in LA was so much better at tennis is because they had year round to practice. And in Canada, you can only practice in the summertime. And I just wonder how true that is about tennis. I think nobody from Canada has ever been good at tennis before. Also, I don't think they have indoor tennis in Canada. So that's true. They might not even have indoors in Canada. Yeah, there are. There's only snow (laughs) and you just cross your fingers and hope Eventually it melts and you can play. (laughs) I'm praying for you Canadians. Then we flash forward to New York right after his surgery and coma. I guess it's right after he gets home and they need him to detox because after the surgery, even though he wasn't in pain, he told them he was on a ton of pain so he could get more Oxycontin. And then they were like, for us to do the second surgery to get rid of your colostomy bag, you have to stop smoking and stop doing drugs. So he has to go back into a rehab and detox. And here he gets so mad at everybody for making him detox so that he can get his surgery to remove the colostomy bag that he hates, that he like goes into a stairwell and just starts banging his head against the stairwell. Somebody said, why are you doing that? I gazed at her and looking like Rocky Balboa from every one of those last scenes, I said, because I couldn't think of anything better to do. Stairwells. So he lands in Los Angeles. The tennis career is kind of dead, but his dad is an actor and he kind of realizes that he could pick up acting too. Yeah, he's the star of his school play, which gives him the idea to become an actual actor. I think his dad gets him an agent. And then one day he's just flirting with girls at the local cafe and somebody drops off a note and says, give me a call. I want you to star in my movie. And sure enough, he gives him the call and stars in his movie. So he gets his first role and he goes home and he tells his dad. And I think already the stress begins that he is clearly destined to be more successful than his dad, who is what's called a journeyman actor, which is not like a phrase I really know. I guess it's just kind of somebody who gets bit roles here and there and can make a living out of it. So he says that his dad was an alcoholic, but like a functioning alcoholic. He would come home every day and have six or seven vodkas until he fell asleep. And every day he would sit down, make himself a drink and say, this is the best thing that had happened to me all day. Dad taught me many good things too, but he certainly taught me how to drink. It's still no accident that my drink of choice was a double vodka tonic. And my thought every time was, this is the best thing that's happened to me all day. But he says, of course, his dad without fail could always wake up and go work. Whereas Matthew was really just done in by his drinking from the beginning. He was not somebody who could function. He talks about one day having a drink and going for a walk around the neighborhood with the usual thoughts. Why are we all here? What's the meaning of all this? What's the point? How did we arrive at this? What are human beings? What is air? I was so troubled. I was an extremely screwed up guy. I do think that's pretty par for the course as a teenager. I feel like to have a drink and be like, what's the point of life? I don't know. That's just every emo kid I knew. So years later, his dad gets sober just by taking a walk one day and deciding to get sober and never drinking again. Excuse me, you went for a walk and quit drinking? I've spent upward of $7 million trying to get sober. I've been to 6,000 AA meetings. I've been to rehab 15 times. I've been in a mental institution, gone to therapy twice a week for 30 years, been to death's store, and you went for a walk? I'll tell you where you can take a walk. But my dad didn't write a play, star on Friends, help the helpless, and he doesn't have $7 million to spend on anything. Life has its trade-offs, I suppose. This begs the question, would I trade places with him? 
why don't we get to that later on? He feels like he could and would trade places with anyone because no one on earth has the level of problems that he has. He has the worst, hardest life in the world and no one else has a problem. So he goes on to star this movie. It's called A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. He plays the best friend of Jimmy Reardon and Jimmy Reardon is played by River Phoenix. And he loves River Phoenix. He spends a little moment talking about his talent, his grace and mourning his passing. He also takes a moment to say... River was a beautiful man inside and out. Too beautiful for this world, it turned out. It always seems to be the really talented guys who go down. Why is it that original thinkers like River Phoenix and Heath Ledger die, but Keanu Reeves walks among us? Why the stab at Keanu? I don't know. And he does it one other time in this book. And it's very subtle. And it's never backed up by a story. And it doesn't make any freaking sense. So that's why I'm hoping it's like some weird inside joke he and Keanu Reeves have. But my suspicion is that he knows he's handsome, but not leading man handsome. And a lot of people, especially men, would look at a Keanu Reeves type and say, well, he's not leading man handsome. I don't know. I feel like Keanu Reeves is the exact kind of guy other guys have a crush on. I feel like he's kind of weird looking though. Yeah, but that's what men love about him. I know, but I wonder if he looks at Keanu Reeves and says like, why not me? Because he does seem to have some resentment about not being a leading man movie star. I guess that that would be crazy if he like- You think he's not crazy? No, I think he's crazy. I just, if that's the reason, that is the most unhinged thing I've ever heard, that he's jealous of Keanu Reeves, so he's gonna walk through his memoir randomly saying, I wish you were dead. There's two options here. It's either a joke or he wishes Keanu Reeves was dead. Because he's jealous. What is the third? Like him and Keanu have beef. And maybe at the bottom of that beef is jealousy. But it's not like he was flipping through a People magazine and said, Keanu Reeves, why him? Fuck that guy. I wish he was dead. I'm going to say it in my book twice. I think there must be some other incident that we don't know about. But it can't just be that he, in his mind, said, here's somebody I think I should be better than. I'm going to wish him dead. Option one is that it's a joke. Option two is that he's deeply jealous of Keanu Reeves. And option three is unknown beef. I'm sorry, but you don't think onion onion beef? (laughs) You don't think unknown beef makes the most sense? I think onion beef makes the most sense. I just don't think it's the case because I feel like he tells so many like random stories in this book. So like, why not his random unimportant Keanu Reeves beef tale? That's my memoir, Beef Tales. Where's the beef, Keanu? So uh, that movie did not do well, but he caught the bug. You know what I mean? He came back and he was an actor now and his life was changed. He's partying a lot, talking to a lot of girls, not banging them. He finally graduates high school and he says that his one request is that both parents come to dinner afterwards and celebrate his high school graduation. And he says... That night at dinner, I was only the third funniest and the third most beautiful. At least a childhood dream of them being together had come true. I am grateful to my parents for attending that dinner. It was an incredibly kind and completely unnecessary thing for them to do. It wasn't unnecessary. In a book where you're like, I became a drug addict because one time my parents put me on a plane alone. And then to be like, hey, listen, if you can make it to my high school graduation, no big deal if you can't. Like, Not to say maybe this is deeply privileged of me to say, but I think your parents going to your high school graduation feels like a standard, like a bare minimum standard. They should come if they can. If they have the means to show up, they should show up. Yeah, and I'm not saying that you should like take it for granted, but this way where you're like, you didn't have to do that. And it's like, no, they kind of did. That's one of the big things of being a parent. You go to the graduation. Anyway, so he's dating Trisha Fisher, half-sister, I think, of Carrie Fisher. Eddie Fisher and Connie Stevens' daughter. That's right, Carrie Fisher's half-sister. This girl was no stranger to charm. He is obsessed with giving the pedigree of every girl he ever fucked. He's like, and this one was famous too. He loves to really let you know the lineage. So he's dating Trisha Fisher. He hasn't had sex yet at this point because he's always partying too much and can't get hard. And then finally, Trisha Fisher is like, let's just try. He keeps saying that he wants to wait till marriage because he's Catholic. And finally, after three months, she's like, enough of this. We're going home and we're boinking. And he finally breaks down and explains to her the situation. And she's like, I got it. And I guess she just got it. Because they did it. They had sex. And he says, and how, pray tell, did you manage to pay such a debt, Mr. Perry, such an onerous debt to the woman who saved your life in one of the most meaningful ways imaginable? Why, good reader? I paid that debt to Trisha by sleeping with almost every woman in Southern California. On one such date back then with another 18-year-old, at one point, the woman stopped dinner and said, let's go back to your house and have sex. Cool. He has a, an unhealthy relationship to sex and that never once gets mentioned in this whole book. And I wonder if he even knows. I wish I'd counted the number of times that he says, and I was out there having sex with every woman in LA County. Cool, bro. You sound healed. 
This really sounds like you're on the other side of something. Years later, Trisha and I would date again while Friends was at its peak. She didn't abandon me, but my old fears crept up and I ended the relationship. I only wish I could truly feel that she didn't abandon me. Truly believe that. Maybe things would be better. Maybe vodka tonic wouldn't have become my drink of choice. Maybe everything would be different or maybe not. But to Trisha and those after her, I thank you. And to all the women that I left simply because I was afraid and that they were going to leave me, I deeply apologize from the bottom of my heart. If I only knew then what I know now, dot, dot, dot. So another one of Matthew Perry's things is he thinks if just like a single butterfly had flapped its wings different, he would have been married with two kids and perfectly healed and happy. And so he's always like, here was a girl I had sex with once and we had a good dinner afterwards. I should have married her and had kids. That would have been great. And I'm like, that's not really how marriage works. He treats women like a path less taken. And I'm like, not that he would take a path with a woman. It's that the woman herself is something to be trodden upon, a direction he could have gone in, not somebody that exists and is human. The woman herself has no ability to make her own decisions to exist as a human or would have her own wants and needs and existence within that relationship. It was just, if I had picked door number four and married Trisha, we'd have two kids now. Anyway, so Trisha, he says, I could have married and maybe I wouldn't be an alcoholic. I just don't think that that's true. (laughs) So then he gives this interlude of a story of a time that he thought he was pitching a movie to Adam McKay, who he knew because he actually had a bit role in Don't Look Up that ended up getting cut from the movie because he couldn't do some of his scenes because he was recovering. But then it turns out he hadn't called Adam McKay. He'd called a software salesman also named Adam. And then he tells another story about a time that he like partied with M. Night Shyamalan and thought he was pitching a movie to M. Night Shyamalan. But then it turns out it was a maitre d' from a restaurant. He has such a weird relationship to famous people. He gets so nervous around them. And he's very acutely aware that even though he is famous, he has no clout. Yeah. He like knows that it's very unlikely that he can get a project off the ground with just his name, even though he's incredibly recognizable. It's a very thin fame that comes with only a hundred million dollars. So now he's 16, 17. He's going to college. He's living in LA. He's pursuing acting. And he had basically his own group of friends and they had their own insomnia cafe, but it was of course a bar. It was Formosa Cafe in Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. We was Hank Azaria, David Pressman, Craig Bierko, and me. We had formed our very own mini rat pack. Him and Hank met when they were 16 and trying to become actors. Hank Azaria, for those of you who don't know, is an extremely successful voice actor who does all of the voices on The Simpsons. He is very rich. He goes on to say, Craig was the funniest. Hank Azaria became the richest. He became the most famous Chandler. And then the other guy was just like a guy. Yeah, David was the craziest. And he became a journeyman as well. He's telling the story of his life. And then he'll always come in with a little interlude like, I can't decide if I actually like people or not. People have needs. They lie, cheat, steal, or worse. They want to talk about themselves. Alcohol was my best friend because it never wanted to talk about itself. It was just always there, the mute dog at my heel, gazing up at me, always ready to go on a walk. It took away so much of the pain, including the fact that when I was alone, I was lonely. When I was with people, I was lonely too. Can I argue that I actually think alcohol does talk about itself in the form of a hangover? I think that's alcohol screaming about itself in your ear for like up to two days for some people. (laughs) I would also argue that saying a bad quality in a person is someone who talks about themselves in your memoir is maybe like flying a little close to the sun. (laughs) Anyway, so then he gets his first kind of recurring role. He'd been doing a lot of guest starring. He's working with Valerie Bertinelli and he is obsessed with her. He thinks she's so beautiful. And at the time she's married to Eddie Van Halen and they are at her house one night and they get really drunk and Eddie Van Halen just falls asleep and he and Valerie make out. And then the next day on set, she acts like it never happened. And he has to kind of figure out how to act like it never happened, even though he's obsessed with her. But then the show gets canceled. So all of his problems were solved. And the whole point of this story was to say, I made out with Eddie Van Halen's wife. There's the two pages of the story, but then there's the two pages of lead up explaining to you how famous Van Halen was at the time. And so it really is just to brag and basically be like, Valley cheated on her famous husband with me and then wanted to act like it never happened. He claims it's important to point out here that my feelings for Valerie were real. You've never had real feelings for anybody in your life. I've spent my life being attracted to unavailable women. It doesn't take a psychology degree to figure out that it has something to do with my relationship with my mother. This is why I say men can't go to therapy because it doesn't make them better. It makes them stronger. Like he sends this whole book being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm obsessed with my mom and that's why I'm cruel to anybody. Anyway, I was being cruel to this bitch and I'm like, learn something from this. People act like if you say you did a bad thing, then it's not bad anymore. But actually you have to show remorse and grow and change or it doesn't count. Listing bad things does not absolve you. I mean, can I read one of the most infuriating lines in this entire book for me? Yeah. He says, even though I'd been in therapy for more than 30 years and it had nothing new to teach me, I had to do something to get my mind off nicotine. 
So I left my cell and headed down the hallway. So this is like a flashback to a time that he was in rehab and he decides to go to therapy, even though there's nothing he could possibly learn in therapy. And then he writes, I stopped in the stairwell and the fact that I was then and still am an unaccompanied minor. This is when he's late 40s, early 50s. Therapy is not done with you if you are in your late 40s calling yourself an unaccompanied minor. I'm not a therapist, so I don't know if that's true, what I just said, but I feel like it is. What about this line? Having to see Valerie every day and pretend I was fine about everything reminded me too much of what I had to do every day with my mother back in Ottawa, Canada. I get it. Everything's your beautiful mother who dared to have a job. That fucking bitch. He's addicted to this thing he calls the turn, and that's when he gets a woman to pay attention to him. Once the turn happened, I could start making a woman laugh and making her want me sexually. Once the sex was done, reality set in, and I realized I didn't know these women at all. They were available, so I had no need for them. I had to get back out there and try to make them make the turn. That's why I slept with so many women. I was trying to recreate my childhood and win. And he goes, I knew none of this at the time, of course, and just thought something had gone wrong with them. Surprise, surprise, everyone. Canadian actor boy had some major mommy issues. This is it exactly. Saying, oh, I was treating people horribly because I had mommy issues and knowing that and then still continuing to treat people horribly. Yeah, I guess there's not really any conclusion where I see now that he has relationships where he values people because in this book up to present day, the only people that are, I think, regularly in his life are his therapist slash assistant slash sober companion that he pays. Aaron, the lesbian who he likes because she's a woman that he can't try to fuck, but acknowledges other women are hot. Right. I don't know that that's a healthy relationship with women. I mean, it's not, <laughs> but I think that's his only relationship with a woman that's been formed in the last 10 years. So it's not like, oh, here's how I felt then. Here's how I feel now. Here's women in my life that I've treated with respect. So him and his friends are at this age. He's getting all these guest starring roles. He's desperate to blow up. They're all getting together every day. The group of friends who he says are the funniest people in the world. And to be funnier than them is pretty much impossible. That's a quote. He also was very honest about the fact that they're obsessed with fame and how they think fame will solve all of their problems. Yeah. Nothing had even remotely brought me fame. And fame, 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 that's all any of us cared about. In between the laughter and after we'd shared the latest stories of auditions gone awry or scripts we read and hated, the quieter moments were filled with a profound worry, a quiet yearning and fear that we would never make it, that fame would just somehow pass us by. We were four strong egos, four funny men, the bon mots flying like shrapnel, but the battle raged on, the battle for fame. I held firm in my belief that fame would fill that unaccompanied hole in me, the one that Valerie refused to fill. That bitch. <laughs> how dare that married woman refuse to love you until you were fixed? No, how dare that married woman refuse to fill a slot that you've <laughs> deemed open in your psyche? How dare she not walk into that mother-sized hole in your heart? And just live there eternally through your drama. She was your coworker. That was her job. He's 24 years old. He's going on auditions. He's hanging out with the boys at the cafe. They're getting drunk every night. And he is already missing a lot of auditions. He's already a mess. He's very addicted to alcohol at this point. At 24, his agent's like, hey, buddy, they need you to not look like shit to cast you. And he's like, oh, okay. And then his business manager calls and goes, by the way, you're out of money. So he calls his agent back and it's like, if I can try not to look like shit for like a second, can you get me something? And they end up getting him a pilot called LAX 2194, which is about baggage handlers at LAX in the year 2194. Which does sound awful. So he's locked up in this and he he knows it's going to suck, but he makes $22,000, which is just enough to get him through the next six months or whatever. I mean, it's just, can I say... It's crazy that he was just like, oh, just get me a pilot. And they're like, okay, we got you a pilot. And then he's like, but this pilot sucks. So then he sees the pilot for a show called Friends Like Us circulating. And he's like, could I get that pilot? And they're like, you just signed a huge contract for this other pilot. You can't be locked into two pilots. And <laughs> Friends Like Us was the hot pilot of the year. Everybody was auditioning for it. Everyone was desperate to get it. He says that reading the pilot, everyone in town would call him and be like, you're so similar to this character Chandler. Will you read lines with me so I can get better at my audition for Chandler? And he's frustrated because he can't even audition for it because he's technically promised to this sci-fi airplane show. You know how people are in airports and they're like, I fucking love the vibe here. I wish I could bring the vibe of an airport to my own home. <laughs> I wish I could bring the vibe of the airport to the future. I hope it stays the same forever. <laughs> I hope that there's baggage handlers in 200 years fucking up my shit. Anyway, so everyone's reading with him. He's desperate to read. He can't. And then who should get the role of Chandler? None other than his friend, Craig Bierko. But Craig Bierko was also offered the lead in another hot pilot called Best Friends, so Craig Bierko is sitting at the cafe with all the boys saying, I've got these two pilots. I've been offered both these roles. Which one do I take? And they were like, well, we hated him, but we were also trying to be supportive. So we were like, 
obviously the better show is Friends Like Us, later to be renamed Friends. And Matthew Perry goes with him to make the call to his agent to officially put in for one of the shows. And when he picks up the phone, Craig just says, no, I'd like to do Best Friends. The other show. The if other show. you're confused because there's two pilots, best friends, friends like us, friends like us becomes friends, best friends becomes nothing. <laughs> yes. Craig picks best friends, the nothing show. And Matthew Perry is sitting there next to his friend being like, okay, so friends like us still needs to cast somebody. So he calls his agent again. He's begging, he's pleading. Finally, he goes to read for it. Luckily, the producer of Friends wanted Matthew Perry and was also dating the producer of LAX 2194. And she was like, is there any fucking chance that this gets picked up? And they're like, not in the world. And she's like, can we have Matthew Perry? And I guess pillow talk, baby. That's how LA deals get made. I actually think that that's true. Anyway, so he gets Chandler. He becomes Chandler from Friends. And this is no lie. I knew right then and there just how huge it was all gonna be. He also makes a deal with God. He says, God, you can do whatever you want with me, but please make me famous. And then he gets cast in Friends and he's like, but God kept his end of the bargain. He did whatever he wanted with me. Now, all these years later, I'm certain that I got famous so I would not waste my entire life trying to get famous. You have to get famous to know that it's not the answer. And nobody who is not famous will ever truly believe that. And here, I think we begin to get to the crux of why I had such a hard problem with him. And it's because just at his core, his values are horrible and he cannot change those values. Yeah. He genuinely believes that if you get famous and rich enough, you will not have problems. And this whole book is about how that's not true, but I can tell he still doesn't believe it. For him to say nobody would ever believe that fame doesn't answer all of your prayers means he is so myopic in his understanding of what people get from the world. There's no way he doesn't believe that that's true. Because I'm like, I believe you. I would never in my million years say, oh, fame would fix your addiction. Right. He definitely doesn't believe it. He definitely is very wrapped up in the fact that I think that he still thinks that if he could go back and do it all again, he would do it bigger and be more famous and richer. Yeah. There's just like, he doesn't believe himself. And that's the problem is that he hasn't really changed. He's still obsessed with fame in this sick way that it's like, how could you think that's the answer? I also want to point out after that phone call where Craig takes the wrong role, he says, Craig's desire to be the star of his own show rather than part of an ensemble saved my life. I don't know what would have happened to me if the phone call had gone the other way. And I love that he's like, really putting the onus on Craig for having made an idiot choice. The problem is that Craig is such a selfish douchebag that luckily I got lucky. <laughs> and he says, I may have ended up on the streets of downtown LA shooting heroin in my arms until my untimely death. I don't know. Or maybe you would have hit a rock bottom and gotten sober and like had a family. I guess maybe if you didn't have unlimited money because of friends to continue fueling your addiction. I mean, there is literally no way to know. Like maybe it could have right. gone worse and maybe it could have gone better. But I do think it's very telling that he thinks without fame, it only could have gone worse. He does not even see in the realm of possibility. If I didn't become Chandler Bing, maybe I would have given up. Maybe I would have gotten a nine to five. Maybe I would have met a woman and I would have settled down and found happiness. Because the only goal is fame. It's fame or bust. It's fame or bust. So then he flashes forward to once again, post colon rupture. He talks about how he was dating someone at the time who he actually proposed to because he was in the haze of recovery and re-addiction and he didn't love her. One of the hard things about addiction books is that it is such like a, a horrible, difficult cycle to break. You know what I mean? There's so many lows that you think are going to be the end and there's so many attempts at recovery and then there's so many relapses that when you read it in a book, especially if it's a book that doesn't go chronologically, it's very hard to keep things straight. I mean, and that's like the tragedy of addiction. It's like the same story over and over again. It's the same pattern that just is so hard to end. And so he's now back at a rehab and there's another surgery and he's now on 1800 milligrams of oxy. And it's kind of hard to be like, okay, where exactly in the timeline are we are? I mean, for 30 years, it was the same timeline of hitting the bottom, going to rehab, trying to stay sober for a few months, a little bit of drinking, a few pills and spiraling back downwards. So in this one, this was during COVID. He's in Switzerland at some new rehab he's never tried before. They're giving him the 1800 milligrams of Oxy every day. He takes a private jet to LA for 175K, which is a fun fact. I didn't know how much it costs to take a jet. And then when he gets to LA, they're like, we can't give you that much Oxy. So he takes a second private jet back to Switzerland to get the Oxy for the night. He also, his heart stops at one point while he's in Switzerland. They bring him back to life. And it like ends up breaking several ribs. And so that's why he had those two scenes cut from Don't Look Up. So here we go. We get to Friends, the moment you've all been waiting for. And the disdain for the cast is 
palpable. It's very bizarre. So he gets there and on the one hand, he's talking about how this is like the greatest 10 years of his life. It's the only thing that kept him alive. It was the only thing that he ever felt excited to go do. He says it's the only time he's ever felt happy was meeting this cast. It really was an ensemble and they were his best friends and they had so much fun and they were always together. He says they were like penguins, a pack of penguins who were there for each other. He says that Jennifer Aniston is actually the only one who he had met prior to like the whole cast being officially cast and meeting for the first time. He had had a crush on her. They met through acquaintances. I was immediately taken by her. How could I not be? And I got the sense that she was intrigued too. Maybe it was going to be something. Back then I got two jobs in one day. So I called Jennifer and I said, you're the first person I wanted to tell this to. Bad idea. I could feel eyes forming through the phone. Looking back, it was clear this made her think I liked her too much or in the wrong kind of way. And I only compounded the error by then asking her out. She declined, which made it very difficult to actually go out with her. But she said she'd love to be friends with me. And I compounded the compound by blurting, we can't be friends. Now, a few years later, ironically, we were friends. Fortunately, even though I was still attracted to her and thought she was so great, that first day we were able to sail right past and focus on the fact that we had gotten the best job Hollywood had to offer. I don't think he sailed right past. He's still very fixated on Jennifer Aniston. For the next 10 years, he talks about never knowing how long he was allowed to look at her for, which is a very bizarre thing to say about a woman that you work closely with for 10 fucking years. Yeah, I feel like to never have discovered respect for her as like a sentient being is shocking. Courtney Cox was wearing a yellow dress and was cripplingly beautiful. I had heard about Lisa Kudrow from a mutual friend, and she was just as gorgeous and hilarious and incredibly smart as my friend had said. Maddie LeBlanc was nice and a cool customer, and David Schwimmer had his hair cut really short. He had hair. So that's that guy. These are all people I love and respect. One of them was a customer, and one of them had hair. Jesus Christ. He feels joy for like the first time in his life, and he says he goes home. That night, I called my friends, except for Craig Bierko, given what had just happened, and told them what a wonderful day I had had. I remember saying that night that I was on a show that was so good, it was better than anything I could have dreamed of writing myself. My friends were also happy for me, but even then, I could sense a shift. He also really needs to make a point that Friends is a very collaborative experience. Anyone could pitch jokes, anyone on the whole set, if you had an idea to make something funnier. And so he says he would pitch like 10 jokes a day and get about two in, not just for himself, but he would write for every character. So he was very involved in the writing process on Friends. He says that right before the show premiered, everyone was very keenly aware that they were about to blow up. He talks about the infamous Vegas trip. Everyone knows about the creators of Friends flew the cast out to Vegas because they were like, this is the last time you'll be anonymous. And they all had a wonderful weekend and then came back to Los Angeles. The show premiered and they were famous. He also says this weird thing about Matt LeBlanc. Occasionally, Matt would come to my dressing room, mostly during season one, and ask me how to say his lines. And I would tell him, and he would go downstairs, and he would nail it. But he gets most improved player, because by season 10, I was going into his room and asking him how to say some of my lines. He then goes on to call him most improved friend every time he mentions him, which feels like an odd dig. He also seems very jealous of how handsome Matt LeBlanc is. He mentions a couple times how he had like movie star good looks. I don't know if he's mentioning it in an insulting way or not. He's talking about how Matt LeBlanc like couldn't nail the character of Joey. This makes a lot of sense. I feel like as an actor to be like, if this character is a hot womanizer, why would these women be his platonic friends? If he's just like fucking women and treating them badly, why would they like him? And that was kind of his conundrum. And then he gets to the bottom of it. It's like, cause he's like just a lovable idiot brother. Well, he was just a big dummy. Well, he was just a big idiot the whole time. (laughs) He didn't even know how to say his lines. I had to tell him at the beginning. But he got better. I guess he's most improved, not best. He then, of course, has to talk about every famous woman he's ever kissed. It turned out one time before he was famous and she was famous. Him and Gwyneth Paltrow made out at a party. Why is that relevant to anything? Nobody knows, but there is not a woman he hasn't touched in any capacity that will not get named first and last name in this book. Well, there are a lot of women he's touched in any capacity that he will not name first and last name in this book, but any of the ones that we've heard of, he will make sure that we know that he boinked them. So then he talks about becoming really famous and he says, most important, would these holes get filled? Would I want to trade places with David Pressman or Craig Burko or they with me? These are his loser friends that didn't make it. What would I tell them down the line when my name became a shorthand for stand-up comedians and late-night hosts, a shorthand that meant addict? What would I tell them when complete strangers hated me, loved me, and everything in between? What would I tell them? And what did I tell God when he reminded me of my prayer, the one I had whispered three weeks before I got friends? He goes on to talk about Craig Burko. He says, we didn't talk for two years after I got Chandler. He moved to New York and we lost touch. And then he goes on to, to mention a review where they talk about how Craig had initially had an offer to do friends. They say, thank God, there's something snidely whiplash about Craig Bierko. Seems to have a lot of anger underneath. The attractive leading man who you love and can do comedy are very rare. Basically saying, thank goodness they cast Matthew Perry, not Craig Bierko. And it's like, why did you need to include that line? Craig Bierko has got way less money than you. It's been 
30 years at this point. I mean, you have to give it up. They didn't talk for two years and Craig comes by and he's like, hey, sorry, I didn't call. Like, I just didn't know what to say to you after how it went down. I said, you know what, Craig? It doesn't do what we thought it would. It doesn't fix anything. Craig stared at me. I don't think he believed me. I still don't think he believes me. I think you actually have to have all your dreams come true to realize that they are the wrong dreams. I guess because Craig thought he would say, hey, man, I miss you. I'd love to catch up sometime and not, hey, man, I know I'm famous and you're not, but it's actually not all it's cracked up to be. (laughs) Given everything, there is no way I wouldn't change places with Craig, David Pressman and the guy in the gas station down the block. I change places with all of them in a minute and forever. If only I could not be who I am the way I am bound on this wheel of fire. They don't have a brain that wants them dead. They slept fine at night. I don't expect that would make them feel any better about the choices they made the way their lives went out. How do you know? It's been 25 years since he spoke to these people. And for some reason, their name keeps coming up in this book is like, you know, my loser friends who never made it that I haven't seen in a while. I would even be losers like them because it sucks to be me. And they have perfect lives despite their loseriness. They've always been empty idiots who I'm sure sleep soundly. I just feel like to assume that you're the only person in the world with problems is so crazy to say the guy in the gas station down the block, you don't know him. You don't know how he sleeps. You don't know what he struggles with. You don't know what his traumas are. What's his family like? I don't, maybe his parents were so tragic as to have gotten divorced like yours. (laughs) This idea that he has had the saddest life out of anybody in the world and that he would trade even with people who aren't famous. And you probably think there's nothing worse than not being famous. You pathetic, unfamous people who will never know how empty famous because you're not famous and you're you're not as amazing as I am. But I would even trade his lives with the you losers, but you wouldn't believe me because from your vantage point, I have a perfect life. And I'm like, I believe you, dude. I believe you, Matthew Perry. I would never trade lives with you. I don't want your stupid little life. I don't care about your $80 million. Stop telling everyone else that they have no problems, but also yet they have the biggest problem of all, which is not being famous. Amen. So then he flashes back in time again to when he was dating Julia Roberts. He talks about their courtship. They met because she was going to come guest star on Friends. She said she would only do it if she could do Chandler's storyline. So then they're faxing back and forth. He sends her flowers. They start faxing every day. He has the entire writer's room of Friends helping him write his faxes to Julia Roberts. He says she's like the funniest, best storyteller. And she was so quick. He's like, I would be out at the bars talking to other girls. And I would leave mid-conversation to go see if I had a fax from Julia. And I'm like, yeah, I know. As a girl at the bar, I know that I do not hold a candle to primetime Julia Roberts. You don't have to sit here and like rub it in. We know. We all know that we're not Julia Roberts. I'm aware. I've been told. Every single fucking day I walk down the streets and a man comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder and goes, I'd say hi, but I have to go home and check for effects from Julia Roberts. And every fucking day I go home alone, okay? <laughs> so that could have been my lover if not for Julia Roberts' faxes. So basically he's talking about the one day that he wishes he could relive because every day is Groundhog's Day in a way, but if he could pick his day that he gets to Groundhog's, he would pick spending New Year's Eve with Julia Roberts. I mean, it sounds amazing. They played touch football in the snow of New Mexico all day and then she got him in her blue pickup truck and drove him to the top of a mountain where they watched the stars. That is a perfect day and I think we all wish we were there. But then he's doing his first big movie. It's Fool's Rush In. He's not very nice to Selma Hayek. Yeah, he stars with Selma Hayek. He takes a real time to make her look like an idiot. Apparently she had an idea. Can you imagine Selma Hayek? What does she have, an Oscar? What does she think she knows about acting? But she would say, oh, I'd love to try it this way. And he'd be like, excuse me, Selma, I'm going to try it my way. Yeah, she would make suggestions like for this scene where we're talking about our relationship. What if instead of looking at each other, we looked straight forward and had this emotional conversation, like not looking at each other. And he was like, why wouldn't we look at each other if we're talking to each other? Also on this trip, There's jet skis. And he says, can I go on the jet skis? And they say no. And he goes, you're not allowed to say no to me. And then he gets on the jet ski. And of course, he falls off the jet ski and he gets hurt and he gets an oxy for the pain. And I stashed that pill in my pocket. And I swear to God, I think if I'd never taken it, none of the next three decades would have gone the way they did. Who knows? I just know it was really bad. I do think that he he has like an addiction that was going to be confronted at some point or another. Right. And if it wasn't oxy, it would have been something else. And if it wasn't this time, it was going to be next time. He was going to have dental surgery at some point and find it then. The pill replaced the blood in my body with warm honey. I was on top of the world. A year and a half later, I was taking 55 of those pills a day. I weighed 128 pounds when I checked into the Hazel Den Rehab in Minnesota. My life in ruins. I was in raw fear, certain I was going to die, having no idea what had happened to me. I wasn't trying to die. I was just trying to feel better. Everyone had their particular years on Friends when the whole world was talking about their character. And he talks about how his most talked about year was the year that he was sober. He talks about how they didn't get nominated for as many Emmys as they deserved. He was like, overall, we all had a year where we shined and like everyone would maybe get nominated for an award that year, but we all should have gotten way more awards. The friend, he goes out of his way to speak 
the highest about outside of Lisa Kudrow, who he thinks in the acknowledgments is David Schwimmer. Season four, David Schwimmer, who I guess was kind of the star at that point. Yeah, he was having his season, came into their rooms and said, I think we should band together and stay an ensemble and ask for more money, but get equal. And he was the spearhead of that idea that we are all equally important to this show. So no one friend should make more money. And he goes, that decision of his made me $30 million that year. And probably many, many millions through the end. He's dating Julia Roberts, but it just becomes too much. He's too anxious about how famous and beautiful she is. So he breaks up with her. And that's a real point that he needs to hammer in. He broke up with her. Girls were coming up and talking to me. The days of nervously approaching women with mediocre lines were over. I just stood in a corner of vodka tonic in hand and they came to me. None of them were Julia Roberts, though. As I have said, we know. (laughs) Julia, if you're listening, scroll ahead. Everyone else. Do we all know that we're not Julia Roberts or does Matthew Perry have to tell us again? Every fucking morning I wake up, I wake up, I wipe the sleep out of my eyes. I roll over and I say, good morning, Bug. And Bug says, good morning, not Julia. Anyway, so then he does a movie with Chris Farley and then Chris Farley dies like two weeks later and Matthew Perry punches a hole through Jennifer Aniston's dressing room wall and says, Chris Farley died. Keanu Reeves walks among us. Why does he hate Keanu? I've detoxed over 65 times in my life, but the first was when I was 26. By the end of season three, I was spending most of my time figuring out how to get 55 Vicod in a day. I had to have 55 every day. Otherwise, I'd get so sick. It was a full-time job, making calls, seeing doctors, faking migraines, finding crooked nurses who would give me what I needed. He says that at one point he is down to 128 pounds, which is at the end of season three. And his heaviest was 225 pounds. And for some reason... They had him in the same outfit at both weights, like the exact same clothes. Okay, so he is back from this first detox, his first stint in rehab. And he loves to kind of tell everyone how the rehab did it wrong. So in this one, they don't really teach him about AA and sober lifestyles. They just kind of detox him and send him back. And this, I understand. I think there's a lot of criticisms of rehab systems. There's like so much for-profit rehab out there and it is really bad. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But I do think he projects a lot of his relapses onto other people. Yeah. He loves to be like, well, they didn't teach me X, Y, Z. And that's why I couldn't stay sober. And it's like, okay. He says, for those of you watching, this was the beginning of season four. The best I ever looked on the show. Still not good enough for Jennifer Aniston, but pretty fucking good. Enough. Enough. It's been 30 years. You have to stop talking about how Jennifer Aniston wouldn't fuck you. It's disrespectful. It's very disrespectful. Is that all she is? She was your coworker for a decade. But she wouldn't fuck you. And that's like all she was reduced to in your mind. He's like talking about how the run up to rehab was probably the best year of my life. The best year anyone could wish for. The joys of fame had not quite worn off. Though if I died then, my headstone still would have read, Here lies Matthew Perry. He broke up with Julie Roberts. Or could I be more stupid and dead? In 1999, I fell hard for a woman I was working with on a movie. I was starting to have a track record of falling for women who were famous, just as my mother had been in Canada. Enough with the Freud. I cannot take it. You cannot be like, I was cold in the winter. Like my mother's heart had been. Is that why my coat wasn't warm up? I mean, literally so far in this book, we have women who are unavailable like his mother, women who are famous like his mother, women are beautiful like his mother. Yeah, women who he's trying to get them to turn their head the way his mother would not turn her head. We get it. Mom stuff. Get a grip. You have to go back to therapy. So then he gets pancreatitis at 30 years old. He's been drinking so much that his pancreas is going to explode. So he has to do like a full detox again. He finds out that he might actually have a problem with alcohol as well as drugs. Owing to David Schwimmer's selfless and brilliant idea, I signed for a deal for season six and seven that made us $50 million. I signed that contract with a feeding tube in my arm. So after this, his dad comes and bails him out. And his dad's like, well, come live with me. And then he's like, okay. So he leaves the hospital. And on the way home, he drives into somebody's house. He gets into a car accident. And he hits the stairs. And he's like, fucking stairwells again. But so he moves into his dad. And after a few months, he's sneaking in drugs, sneaking in alcohol. At this point, his dad was sober because he had taken that walk. And his stepmother is like, you can't be here anymore. So they kick him out. He says, okay, I'll leave. But neither of you will ever see a dime of my money ever. I thought, but I did not say. That's not your parents being shitty. Good. I don't think your dad would have wanted your money in exchange for allowing you to continue your addiction. I don't think he would be like, pay me off to enable my son's addiction. Yeah, because then one page later with a bit of disdain, he talks about how he was drinking and he wouldn't drink while shooting, but he would arrive to set kind of fucked up and say, everyone would ask me if I was all right, but no one wanted to stop the friends train because it was such a moneymaker. And I just felt horrible about it. So, I mean, do you want people who are going to just take the money and enable you? Or do you want people who are going to kick you out? He says he was never higher drunk on set, but he was taking 55 Vicodin a day. 
though how? So I guess he wasn't getting high. It was like maintenance fight get in, but he, he wasn't sober on set. I know you're drinking, she said. I had long since gotten over her ever since she started dating Brad Pitt. I was fine and had worked out exactly how long to look at her without it being awkward. But still, to be confronted by Jennifer Aniston was devastating and I was confused. How can you tell, I said. I never work drunk. I've been trying to hide it. We can smell it, she said, in a kind of weird but loving way. And the plural we hit me like a sledgehammer. So he freaks out. He calls his manager. He's like, they're on to me. Get me a movie. And I don't know what was in his contract that allowed him to do that. But for some reason, he takes on this movie called Serving Sarah that he shoots in Texas four days a week. So in response to everyone being like, you're slurring your words and not doing a good job with your performance because you're obviously high. He's like, well, what if I worked less? <laughs> what if I worked more? Like he doubles his workload, but is on the friends set less. Yeah. So now he's in Texas a couple days a week doing Serving Sarah, flying back to LA to shoot friends. And then at one point, it just hits a breaking point and he has to go back to rehab. So they had to pause serving Sarah. They have to shoot friends without him. And then he has to go back and shoot his scenes later. He's like, I never let my addiction get in the way of work. And it's just like, that doesn't seem true. I was living in rehab when Monica and Chandler got married. It was May 17th, 2001. Two months earlier, on March 25th, 2001, I'd been detoxing one night when the powers that be decided to give us all a night off to watch the Academy Awards. This is the night that Julia Roberts wins an Oscar for Aaron Brockovich. I made a joke. I'll take you back. I said, I'll take you back. The whole room laughed that this was not a funny line in a sitcom. This was real life now. Those people on the TV were no longer my people. No, the people I was lying in front of shaking, covered in blankets were my people now. And I was lucky to have them. They were saving my life. I think Julia Roberts would be really freaked out to know how much she is in this book. They did it for four months. 30 years ago. I think Gwyneth Paltrow would be freaked out to find out she's in this book. I think everyone in this book would be like, don't talk about me like that. Yeah. I think even the people that deserve to be in this book, Jennifer Aniston, Matt LeBlanc, they'd all be like, why did you say that about me? This is so bizarre. I wish I hadn't been in your book. So then we get to his friendship with Bruce Willis. They meet because the director likes Matthew Perry for a role in The Whole Nine Yards, which is has Bruce Willis already attached to it. He t talks about this woman, Jamie, that he calls like a sweet angel sent from heaven. She had completely nursed him through serving Sarah and the rehab afterwards. So he gets out of rehab. He gets clean. To be clear, in order to adequately pay sweet, wonderful Jamie back for two years of giving up huge portions of her own very busy, important life by basically being my nurse, I ended our relationship. He told her that he needed to be single while he was getting sober. What I said to Jamie that day was all bullshit, of course. I was newly sober. I was a huge star and I wanted to sleep with every single girl in Southern California. And I did. Insert cartoon anvil landing on my head here. Hilarious. I love that cartoon anvil bit. This is something that I think we gave Danny Trejo a lot of credit for. And I am happy we did because we don't see it often in these male addiction memoirs. But Danny Trejo did a really good job in his book acknowledging the way he fucked people over and treated people terribly without glamorizing it, without seeming to kind of get off on it. Even though he's saying like, oh, can you believe I did that? There's such a sense of like, look how bad I was to people in this way that's like, uh, I fucked everyone over. I was so mean. And then I fucked every girl in town. I wasn't cool about it. It was awful. Anyway, how's my dick taste? <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's really grotesque to me to be sitting here and almost doing it again. Yeah. Anyway, so he talks about how he had this speech lined up for every time he'd go out with a girl, he'd say like, I'm not going to be your boyfriend. Listen, sweetheart, take a look at the menu. You order whatever you want, but just know I'll never love you. I'll never be your boyfriend. If you're here for a fun time, great. But if not, get out of here. And then he's like, you have no idea how often that worked. He talks about dating one girl who was like the child of other celebrities. Natasha Wagner, who was the daughter of Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner. Yeah. Okay. So if they have famous parents or if they're famous themselves, they get named in the book. He dates her for a bit. And then she calls him a couple years later and is like, hey, how are you? I just want to let you know I have a baby now. And he pulls over and cries because he's like, that should have been my baby. During that time, I met at least five women that I could have married, had children with. Had I done so just once, I would not now be sitting in a huge house overlooking the ocean with no one to share it with, save a sober companion, a nurse, and a gardener twice a week. I mean, that's, that's not, not true. true. <laughs> it's not just one single moment of choice. He really thinks it's like a, a button you switch that never goes back. Yeah. I guess having a baby, you can't put that baby back. But still, being a father is a lot of work. Anyway, he talks about being sober for periods of time. He was sober for two years of Friends, season nine, which was the best season Chandler ever had. He got nominated for an Emmy. That was a sober season. Some quiet days when I was sober, I think back to the recent past and wonder why I'd ever picked up pills or drugs after getting clean. When I was sober, strong and feeling like a normal person, I'd sometimes have fantasies of putting on a baseball cap and shades and heading off to mingle with the regular people poking around the La Brea tar pits or standing next to some celebrity star on the walk of fame just to see what it's like. 
These people who have perfect lives, who don't think that fame will get you everything. What are they doing? They're just sitting around like, God, I wish I wasn't a celebrity. I wish I was a regular person just looking at celebrities. So then he gets a script for a movie called The Whole Nine Yards. Bruce Willis is already attached. So obviously Matthew Perry's eyes go gaga. He gets really excited to work on this project. And so right before this, he'd had a moment of weakness. He got into a fight with his girlfriend. She had some pills on the table. He ended up taking them. So he's like, okay, if I'm going to go do this Bruce Willis movie, I need to have a handful of pills with me that I can take the edge off of the drinking that I'm going to do with Bruce Willis. It turns out to be a gangbusters plan. It works perfectly. They film the movie. It becomes a sensation. He says, Michael J. Fox and I are the only two people who've had the number one movie and the number one TV show at the same time. But instead of a grand moment of pure fame, dealing with dealers was all I was doing. Believe it or not, all this fame, it still doesn't make him happy. He needed to listen to Lucky by Britney Spears because she knew. She knew. But he tells this other story. I just, I don't know why I have to keep telling you guys every story where he's disrespectful to a woman. But he tells a story about a girl he dated for a while. She was a waitress. They met because him and his friend were taking bets about whether she was a Samantha or a Jennifer, what her name was. It turned out her name was Renee. They dated until he moved to Montreal to film the whole nine yards. By the time I went to Montreal, we were mostly on the outs. But in any case, and I'm not proud to say this, I would have fucked mud at that stage in my life. Canadian mud at that. You hear that woman that he had sex with? You were mud to him. Canadian mud, perhaps. He cheated on his, who knows what her name, waitress girlfriend was with Canadian mud, who's humans, but not to him. I just feel like, why be so disrespectful all the time? I can't handle it. Anyway, he... Ends up losing control of this very controlled relapse he has where he's able to party with Bruce Willis all night and then take one pill sometimes. He was doing this thing where he would take a pill to help him go to sleep so that he wasn't up all night so at least he could get some sleep. But he was also having the hotel sneak him a handle of vodka in the bathroom and he would have to drink the whole handle every night just to get his shakes at bay. He also throws Amanda Pete under the bus for some reason and is like, she was a flirt. She flirted with everybody. At one point, Bruce Willis said, pick one of us. I don't know. Every woman who's ever seemed remotely sexually interested in him, to his opinion, got named or they got dragged a la Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. You either fucked him or you didn't and he never forgave you. He ends up not really staying friends with Bruce Willis, which is like a huge problem for him. And he says, I, of course, pray for him every night now. Matthew, maybe pray for yourself. So then his addiction kind of spirals again and he has like moments of absolute psychosis. He tells his dad that a snake is going to eat him. And then he sees God. So that's pretty important. He's sitting in the kitchen and like a golden sliver appears in thin air and it engulfs him with warmth and that's God. And so then he stays sober for two more years because he saw God. A year later, I met a woman I'd stay with for six years. God is everywhere. You just have to clear your channel or you'll miss it. So the woman he's with for two years after this or for six years after this is Lizzie Kaplan. Yeah, well, he doesn't actually name her. I think she's the only famous person that he bangs that doesn't get named, but he does say enough details about her that it's definitely Lizzie Kaplan. Friends comes to an end. The truth was we were all ready for friends to be done. For a start, Jennifer Aniston had decided that she didn't want to do the show anymore. And as we all made decisions as a group, that meant we all had to stop. Jennifer wanted to do movies. (laughs) We all wanted to end the show. We all being Jennifer, that bitch. I love that it's like, how dare she want to do movies? I was already doing movies. What else were you guys going to do? The show was done. Everybody had dated everybody. All that was left were gay things. And you guys were not ready to go there in 2005. It's true. So friends was his reason to get out of bed every morning. And without that, things started to spiral again. He also made the whole 10 yards, which came out right around the time that friends ended. And that follow up was an absolute flop. So he says that because that movie flopped and friends was gone, Hollywood decided to no longer invite Mr. Perry to be in movies. I will say towards the end of friends is when he had done the whole nine yards, which had been a huge success. Then he did Serving Sarah, which was an absolute disaster that he had to halt the production to go to rehab. And he ended up getting sued by the production and had to pay $650,000 to the production. That movie flopped. Then he did the whole 10 yards. That movie absolutely flopped. I think that like these movies flopping wasn't necessarily the reason Hollywood didn't want to work with him anymore. It's because he kept halting production to go to rehab that they didn't want to work. He was showing up drunk. He was showing up late. He was doing drugs the entire time. I don't think he's pleasant. I don't think he's kind. He really puts a lot on this one movie flopping as to why his career stalled. And it's like, I think it was because word got out that you're very difficult to work with. Holiday season is upon us. The party invites, they're going to be coming left and right. If you are excited to wear something new, you don't want to wear the same thing to every single holiday party. So you want to try newly. Rent any six styles you want every single month. You choose whatever you want for whatever you have going on. It's completely up to you. 
You have access to thousands of styles from more than 300 brands, everything from party dresses to premium denim and one-of-a-kind vintage pieces. Newly stocked styles in a range of sizes from petite to plus sizes up to 5X and maternity. You'll always find an option to buy what you love, sometimes up to 70% off. I also like it to try things out. I have been looking at the girls online and been like, could I be a long skirt lady? I thought I could. I wanted to be. I rented it from Newly. I am not. But now I haven't wasted an entire amount of money on a new wardrobe. I really was like, up oh, and now I know. This holiday season, you can also gift one, two, or three months of Newly through the gifting platform, Goody. It's also the perfect place to get all of your holiday outfits out of the way in one go with six items to choose from and the option to add two bonus items you can get from. Friendsgiving, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, holiday parties, Christmas, New Year's, and any of the other events you've got going covered in just one bag. Newly is a great value at $88 a month for any six styles, but right now you can get $20 off your first month of Newly when you sign up with the code WORM20. That's N U U L Y dot com, Newly with two U's and the code WORM20. Newly subscription clothing rental, change your clothes. And if you want to enjoy the holidays to the absolute fullest, you're going to need to get some sleep. Bowl and Branch sheets are, I think, the softest I've ever tried. And I have tried a lot of different sheets. Claire and I both have organic cotton sheets from Bowl and Branch. They are my absolute favorite. I have them in spruce because I think the pop of color makes my bed look so nice. Plus the little bug hairs don't show up on it. I love mine. They're my favorite sheets. I have a couple rotations of like different sheets and I actually only use these. Bowl and Branch products are made differently so that you can sleep better at night every single night. They're made from the finest 100% organic cotton on earth, free from toxins, pesticides, and harsh chemicals. And they're made by artisans who earn the pay and respect they deserve. Their signature sheets come wrapped and ready in a beautiful holiday gift box so that your holiday gifts look as special as they feel. And it creates a perfect unbox experience that your gifties will never forget. Bring home a better night's sleep this holiday season with Bowl and Branch Bedding. For a limited time, get 20% off your first set of sheets and free shipping when you use the promo code WORM at BowlandBranch.com. That's Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, Branch.com, promo code WORM. So then he gets into a long on and off situation ship that he was in. And this is the Lizzie Kaplan one that we mentioned. He said the first two years they were friends with benefits. The friends with benefits morphed into love. She was 23 and I was 36 when we first met. In fact, I knew she was 23 because I'd crashed her 23rd birthday party. This is gross. But then he's like, what do I do next? And he ends up on the most famous show of all time. Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. I, for some reason, have a vivid memory of a scene of this show that has been locked in my mind forever. And I think I've always been like, what was that show? And it was crazy to be like, ah, it was this thing. It's basically the newsroom, but it it tries to be funny. It fails. It flops. It gets canceled after one season. It flops. And he blames Aaron Sorkin. The end. Basically, he's like, listen, Aaron Sorkin can write a serious thing, but this was supposed to be funny. And I'm funnier than he is. And he didn't listen to any of my ideas. So the show flopped. Also, I wasn't even making that much money. And it's like, yeah, they were right to not pay you a lot. The show flooped. Then he goes back to his on again, off again, friend with benefits turned romance. He says that the romance had really blossomed into love. So he decides to commission her this painting. He goes, this is the most expensive gift I ever bought anybody. It's a painting of them sitting separately in a room texting each other. And he says that when he gave her the painting, he should have proposed. But instead, I missed the moment. Maybe she'd been expecting it. Who knows? I'd been seconds away, seconds and a lifetime. I often think if I'd asked, now we'd have two kids in a house with no view. Who knows? I wouldn't need a view because I'd have her to look at. The kids too. Instead, I'm some schmuck who's alone in his house at 53 looking down an unquiet ocean. That's not how it works. Marriage isn't the single moment you propose. If you can't even get yourself to propose, I do not think you would have been a good husband. Like your life would not have fallen into place if one sentence had been uttered differently. That's only true if the one sentence is stop the train right before the train crashes into something. He then tries to write himself a new show called Mr. Sunshine. It also gets canceled immediately. He's like, something weird about every show I'm in is that it starts out to really high ratings. And then by the end of the season, it gets canceled. And I'm like, Aye, that's bad. That's like the worst version. A lot of people gave us a chance and it just was not worth chancing on. So then he had someone say something to him at one of his rehabs. I liked the drama and the chaos of my addiction. I was really pissed off. But what if he was right? He was. After Friends, after the movies, and after that six-year relationship, fall, rise, and rise and fall, after everything, for the next six years, I found myself bound upon an odyssey. 
So he also writes this show called Go On, which also gets canceled. And he goes to another rehab called Cirque Lodge in Sun Valley, Utah. It sounds beautiful. I needed to move on and get up and realize that there was a whole big world out there and it was not out to get me. In fact, it had no opinion of me. It just was. This is the thing that, again, I truly don't think he believes. Yeah, because later he'll be like, I was saved for a reason. Also, he believes that he has the worst life in the world and that everything that's ever happened has been out to get him. His mom answering a work call was her personally attacking him. Like every single thing that's ever happened was at him. And now he's like, it wasn't all about me, but it was. Yeah, but he's also like, there's a reason that I lived and nobody else lived. And I'm like, yeah, because you were the richest dude in the room. So then he has this thing that happens to him that does suck. And I do not blame him at all. He gets this famous sponsor and he's sober for a few years and they work together and they become best friends, which is probably crossing a boundary. But they're talking every day. Every time something bad happens to Matthew Perry, he calls his sponsors like, what should I do? His sponsor is not famous, but he's famous in the AA world for being celebrity sponsors. Things are going great. He's feeling better. And then the sponsor's like, let's start a business together. Matthew Perry gives him half a million dollars to start Matthew Perry's sober house. The house does not work. They can't afford to keep it running. He loses all his money. He loses his sponsor the same day. He doesn't lose all of his money. He says he lost half a million dollars. He loses the, the money. Oh, yeah. All of that money private jet for the day money and he loses his sponsor which I understand I mean that shouldn't have happened and it sucks that somebody he trusted and was helping him the fact that someone who he like kind of trusted his sobriety to failed him was not good for his sobriety in the meantime he becomes a real advocate for addiction he's going to Washington he fights Christopher Hitchens dork little brother on TV he's really proud of like running circles around him I'm like it didn't sound hard buddy yeah he also writes a play that premieres in the West End in London it does well there and then it comes to America and it gets panned. He made $600 on it. Yeah. He also mentions that the on again, off again, once friends with benefits, then serious painting romance girlfriend now lives in London with her new boyfriend. So he invites her to the play. I guess they'd kept up over email, a coffee here and there. And so he invites her to the play and she's like, we're actually getting married. And I don't think you and I can be friends anymore. Well, first he says, will you come see it? And she goes, I'll catch you stateside. I'm too busy. I replied that I was a little hurt that she couldn't make it. The play was being performed in her town, for God's sake. And then a while later, I got back an email telling me that she was getting married and that she had no room in her life for friends. I never replied to that email and we've never spoken since. It was an incredibly harsh way to reveal the news that she was getting married and not something I would ever do to a person. But there you have it. I mean, I guess revealing that you're getting married is not something you would ever do to a person because you're not getting married. But I guess treating women that have nursed you through rehab stints and hospital stays and all kinds of really difficult shit that is something you do do to people. He also says the reason they broke up is because once he got sober, she didn't like not being with somebody not fucked up anymore. And I'm like, Matthew, baby. (laughs) I don't know. I just can't imagine that she said, I'm getting married, so I have no room in my life for friends. I think she said, for your friendship, that seems very needy and not taking a clear cut no. He goes to a trauma camp where he has to draw it with stick figures. His trauma, I guess he drew him being on a plane (laughs) as a little kid. Then he meets another woman. He So he starts dating his friend's sister, who's a stand-up comedian and just brilliant. He loves her so much. They have a beautiful romance. And then one day he's giving a talk at an AA and this woman named Rome pops her head in the window, which I don't even understand. And he goes, what was I to do? Now there was the problem of Rome. And I was like, problem of Rome? She's a woman who walked by a window. He started dating them both. There's no other answer. He says to break up with Laura would be insane. She had it all. We had it all. We were each other's best friend, but the intimacy was scaring me. He says one page earlier, I'm a romantic, passionate person. I've longed for love. It's a yearning in me that I cannot fully explain because that's not what it is. He has obviously a huge problem with intimacy and he has a belief that the proper romantic relationship would solve all of his problems. I think that he thinks a family and a woman who loves him and stands by his side has like replaced fame because now he has fame and he's, he's like fame isn't it. So it's a family. But the thing that he views as a family isn't a thing he's willing to work towards. He needs someone by his side, but he's not going to be by anyone's side. As soon as Rome popped up, he was like, well, I'm just going to cheat on Laura, I guess. And then he has to pick between them. So he finally picks Laura, but now that means him and Laura are going to have to get close and intimate. There was one other option. I could remain in the relationship, but turn back to drugs and try to maintain a low habit. This would protect me from fear, allow me to drop my walls and become even more intimate with her. Turning to drugs has led to nothing but chaos for me. And yet inconceivably, I chose to do it one more time to deal with the Laura situation. The Laura situation is a Maddie situation. I don't like that he's calling it like the Laura problem. The Laura problem is 
the problem of him not being able to like be by someone's side. He's going to have to listen to someone who's not himself. And so he's like, I'm not to be on drugs for that. The long and the short of it is, of course, he ends up losing both women. A few months later, he tries to get Laura back with roses. And when he goes, it turns out her and Rome have met at an AA meeting and now they're roommates. But luckily, seven years later, they both forgave him and they've both moved on. And of course, he's still alone. He said he had them both over for dinner with their partners. And I'm like, wow, you're really asking to feel sad. (laughs) I just also think like, okay, so you are the neediest ex of all time. I understand why Lizzie Kaplan had to cut you out. You were probably like, do you want to come see my play? And then you and your husband could come out for dinner and then we could all move in together. And then we could all meet some of my other exes and then we could all go get dinner. Then he tells this weird story about being on a blind date with Cameron Diaz. I guess you don't call it a blind date if it's famous people because you've seen each other, just not in person. So he's on a date with Cameron Diaz and she tries to punch him in the arm. He spends like an entire page talking about how he was in really good shape and he tanned his biceps for this date. And then she tries to like give him a playful punch in the arm. She's stoned. He says she's like high as hell the whole time. They're playing Pictionary. So then she punches him in the face by accident and he's like, it was really violent. Why did you tell us that? Just to say that you went on a date with Cameron Diaz? So then we're back in the throes of addiction, rehab, detox, sobriety, relapse. I remember thinking, man, no one taught me the rules of life. I was a complete mess of a person, selfish, narcissistic. Everything had to be about me. And I matched that with a really handy inferiority complex and almost fatal combo. So essentially what happens here is when his colon ruptured, he had to have an ostomy bag temporarily installed in his body. After his body healed for like nine months to a year, he was going to be able to have the ostomy bag taken out provided he like stayed off drugs. He didn't continue to do further damage to his body. He was also not supposed to smoke during that time. He continued to do drugs and smoke during that entire time, but he was able to kind of quit doing drugs because one therapist said, do you want to have an ostomy bag for the rest of your life? Or do you want to keep doing drugs? And he hated the ostomy bag so much that he was like, I guess I'm done. He also says that he had such a high tolerance to drugs and alcohol that he just like couldn't get fucked up anymore. They're like weren't an amount of drugs unless he turned to heroin basically. And he says he was on 1800 milligrams of Vicodin at a time. And he's like, at one point I realized I was having 17 triple vodkas in a sitting and he still wasn't fucked up. I mean, it really is the therapist being like, do you want an ostomy bag? And he just goes on and on and on about how the idea of having an ostomy bag for the rest of his life it just like wouldn't be worth living. And I'm just like, there are a lot of people who really need those in order to have any semblance of a normal life. And you're really saying a big fuck you to them right now. I ended up on Ask Me Bag TikTok for a while. I have a real parasocial friendship with this one girl who's really walked me through her journey. And I'm just like, don't be mean to her. <laughs> he would trade lives with even her. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so we're present day in the recovery room in the hospital where he was for five months. Both my mom and I are experts in a crisis now. What I've always wanted to tell her is that that little show called Friends and all the other shows and movies, I essentially did it all for her attention. That's the one person whose attention I did not really get from Friends. She mentioned it on occasion, but she was never boiling over with pride about what her son had accomplished. I'm sure she was trying not to be like, this is all you are. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think she was trying to respectfully be like, oh, everyone knows you as this larger than life figure. But to me, you're just my son. So I'm not going to act like you're just Chandler from Friends. I'm going to act like you're my son. But I don't think there's possibly a way that she could have been proud enough for what I needed. And if you're going to blame your parents for the bad stuff, you also to give them credit for the good stuff. All the good stuff. I could never have played Chandler if my mother wasn't my mother. I would never have made $80 million if my mother weren't my mother. Because Chandler was just a hider of true pain. What better character ever a sitcom? To just make a joke about everything so we don't have to talk about anything real. That's how Chandler started. I really do think he's still like, listen, on the bright side, I'm still famous. And I'm like, the whole point of your own book is that the fame didn't fix it. He needs to read this book. No, he doesn't. No one should. I find his obsession with fame to be unique. 30 years of twice weekly therapy, 10 rehab stints, group therapy, trauma camp, The fact that at the end of this day, he's like, hey, but at least I still made $80 million and became really famous, right? Like at his core, he still thinks that's what it was all about. He still thinks that was the value that he was chasing. And I think that that is unique and unfixable. He mentions a couple of times that there was like a more, more, moreness to it. Like he says at one point at the height of Friends, ER was still a bigger deal and he kind of wished he was on ER. It's not that he would trade lives with anyone. It's just that he like wants to be able to start from scratch and like see if he could do it bigger. I don't have another sobriety in me. If I went out, I would never be able to come back. And if I went out, I would go out hard. I would have to go out hard because my tolerance is so high. The idea of being famous, the idea of being rich, the idea of being me, I can't enjoy any of it unless I'm high. And I can't think of love without wanting to be high. 
I lack a spiritual connection that protects me from these feelings. That's why I'm a seeker. That's the problem is he thinks there's still a way to enjoy being famous. He thinks he can get back to that first year and be like, what if I was always dating Julia Roberts? And what if I was always the new hotshot? And I was always doing David Letterman for the first time. He still doesn't understand that that high isn't real. No. That that's not what sustains a person and fulfills a person. And that's the problem is he's, he thinks there's a version of his life that could be done well. And that those things that he's been chasing, there is still a reason to chase. Well, Cause them. the thing to chase is still not within himself. Like the thing is still not him. The disease, the big horrible thing. Addiction has ruined so much of my life. It's not funny. It ruined relationships. It ruined day-to-day process of being me. I have a friend who doesn't have any money, lives in a rent controlled apartment, never made it as an actor, has diabetes, is constantly worried about money. doesn't work. And I would trade places with him in a second. In fact, I would give up all the money, all the fame, all the stuff to live in a rent controlled apartment. I'd trade being worried about money all the time to not have this disease, this addiction. Listen, a lot of people would do crazy things for rent control. (laughs) But do you guys hear what I'm saying? The fact that he's still like, no, you don't understand. I'd be poor. No, you wouldn't, dude. And the fact that you're even saying this and you're still making this point is why I know that you don't believe it. He jumps back into relationships and how like the one time he opened up to a girl, she dumped him. So now, you know, he doesn't really do that anymore. He has this memory about being on the cast of Friends that time when he couldn't film because he had been in rehab. Two weeks later, I was driven to the set of Friends by a technician from Malibu. When I arrived, Jen Aniston said, I've been mad at you. Honey, I said, if you knew what I'd been through, you would not be mad at me. With that, we hugged and I got the work done. Not that it's about what he put people through, but that would have been a time to be like, God, this is the best time of my life. And I, I, I was letting them down. Well, because all he ever says is this was the best time of my life and I wasn't about to ruin it. And it's like, but you kind of did. I don't think he realizes that he has ever impacted somebody. Even one of those times he talks about relapsing when he went to break up with the girl that he's like, I told her that I would never date her for real. And we accidentally fell in love. And then when I broke up with her, She was hysterical and crying and just like banging on the door and so upset. And she happened to have Viking in there. And so I relapsed. It's like, there's not even a minute of like, wow, I can't believe I put that woman through that thing. Yeah. was really hurt by me. He talks about his recovery and he says, if a selfish, lazy fuck like myself can change, then anyone can. I mean, has he changed? I mean, the irony, of course, is that on the literal page beforehand, he talks about when he was sober at one point. He said there was good side effects of sobriety. I was also single for some of it. So I'd go to clubs and I didn't want to drink. The miracle had happened for me. And let me tell you, no one is more popular at 2 a.m. in a club than a sober guy who says, hi, how are you to a woman? I don't think I've ever gotten laid more than in those two years. All it's ever been about is sex for him. It's sick. And it's so weird that that's not acknowledged in this book. He never acknowledges how disrespectful he is to women 30 years of therapy nothing left to learn except that maybe he talks about his friends pressman birko any of them and how he would trade lives with any one of them because none of them had the big terrible thing to deal with none of them had battled their entire lives with a brain that was built to kill them i would give it all up to not have that and no one believes this but it's true i believe it i guess i just don't believe that all of your friends have had perfect lives I also don't think you believe it. I don't believe you. I don't believe that you would give it all up because I think at the end of the day, when you die, it was really important for you to say, I dated Julia Roberts and I broke up with her. He then has a chapter about trying to quit smoking. He goes to a hypnotist, even though he doesn't believe in hypnotism. He has one of my favorite red flags in a human being, which is somebody that doesn't believe they can be hypnotized because they're too smart. Yeah, he goes, good luck trying to slow down this racing racer's brain. Anyway, the guy does do it. He like hypnotizes him into quitting smoking, but then he bites into a peanut butter toast and all of his teeth fall out. And then he has to like take drugs again in order to deal with his tooth surgeries. And then he starts smoking again. He then goes into gratitude. It's his final chapter. It's called Batman. He wants to thank everybody that he's grateful for. The list is his parents, his mom and dad, the LA Kings for winning the Stanley Cup a few years ago. That was a great distraction for him. And he was a part of it. And then his paid for lesbian, Aaron. (laughs) He also says thank you to the Friends stars. He thanks David Schwimmer for helping them get all that money. Lisa Kudrow, no woman has ever made me laugh that much. Courtney Cox for making America think someone so beautiful would marry a guy like me. I roll. Jenny for letting me look at that face an extra two seconds every single day. Why would you say that about her? Why She was never a person to him. It's so sick. She They were coworkers and colleagues at like the highest creative level. You know what I mean? Like they were working together, not physically intimately, but like intensely every day. In for a way- 10 years. Why is all that she is is somebody who didn't fuck him? And Maddie LeBlanc, who took an only sort of stock character and turned him into the funniest character on the show, still most improved, I suppose. He like gets up from thinking about all the things he's grateful for. He looks out at the water and says very quietly, maybe I'm not so bad after all. And I head back in for more coffee. He ends it with, who am I going to be? Whoever it is, I will take it on as a man who has finally acquired the taste for life. I fought that taste, man. I fought it hard. But in the end, admitting defeat was winning. 
Addiction, the big terrible thing, is far too powerful for anyone to defeat alone. Someday, you too might be called upon to do something important. So be ready for it. Do what? I wonder what is the important thing that he did. Is it this book? Is it beat his addiction? I don't know. It's like a weird final line. Like, by the way, brother, at some point you may be doing something as cool as me. You won't be as famous as me, but you might have something important to do. And when whatever happens, just think, what would Batman do and do that? What is he talking about? In conclusion, Ash, what are your thoughts? In conclusion, my thoughts are, I'm very glad he's sober. I really hope he stays sober. I really hope he examines his relationship with other humans. I do not hope he ends up in a partnership soon before he's reexamined his relationship with other humans. And I do think he seems like a really not kind person. I would hate to go on a date with him. Thank God he said no to you on Raya. Yeah, I'm very lucky and I'll be grateful every day. I guess that's what Batman would do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. It was just a very bizarre book of somebody who I think was being very honest and my heart goes out to him. Like addiction is so hard and terrible and I do not blame him for the addiction. I do think soberly the choices he made looking back, the lack of accountability for anything in his life, the lack of concern for the way he's made people feel, the way he talks about women, the way he talks about Keanu Reeves. Is he a bad person? I swear to fucking God, say one more thing about Point Break's hero. It was just an odd read. And I think specifically coming out of this PR onslaught, we were all expecting something great. I mean, my mom texted me the other day and was like, I read this thing he wrote in the New York Times. I was crying. It was so good. This is gonna be such a great book. And I kind of came in hoping for something good. And what we found was one of the more fame obsessed people. It's very, it was an odd book. It was a very odd book. I definitely don't recommend it. I do think it's an interesting story and I'm glad we read it. I mean, there was a lot of quote unquote tea, but it made me honestly appreciate all the other memoirists who did not exploit the shit out of everyone they've ever met. It felt really gross to be like, and then I fucked this celebrity and then I fucked this celebrity and then Cameron Diaz was high and then I kissed Gwyneth Paltrow. It's enough with it. You know, Natalie Wood, she died. Banged her daughter. Yeah. (laughs) Enough, Matthew Perry. I hated it. I hated it. Um, I didn't hate it. It was like a good enough (laughs) read, but I did not like him. And I, I mean, good luck to you. To quote Lisa Kudrow, I guess you're alive. Good for you. (laughs) (laughs) And Ashley, who should we thank this week? Thank you so much to our five-star wormies. Thank you so much to C. Marie Turner. You turned my whole damn world around. Thank you. What's brown and sticky? I won't guess. I just want to trust you. Thank you so much for your beautiful review. Thank you, St. Fanny. You have the cutest Fanny in the game. Thank you, Vickies. You make it look easy, baby. Thank you, O'Leary J. Pint of Guinness on me. Thank you, Julia Gremlin. I'll make sure not to feed you after midnight. I promise. Thank you, Claire and Ashley. Love Hannah the most. We really do. Thank you, Jess S1015. Tonight at 1015, everyone think of Jess S. Thank you, Sarah Bolhausen. That's my favorite kind of bowl. I got to get more of those for my kitchen. Thank you around the farm table. All of the chickens and ducks are joining me in a big thank you. Thank you, Stephanie 11312. Oh my God, 312 is one of my favorite beers from before I was old enough to drink, but I still like it. Thank you, Alana Karen. Gorgeous name for a gorgeous review. Thank you, Lauren Love 69. Oh, hell yeah. Thank you, VO Purple. The prettiest color out there for queens, pretty much. Thank you, T Mellow 3200. Keep it mellow, baby. Thank you, KTDICSDJ. I don't know what that means, but I appreciate it. Thank you, OTW1. I'm on the way back to say thanks. Thanks, Lou91. Best year I know. Thank you, Fanchon the Cricket. You know I fucking love bugs. Thank you, a five 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 A. Thank you for this review. Thank you, Cassidy Leah. As long as this isn't Leah Michelle in disguise, I fucking adore you. Please read this review. I'm reading it. I'm loving it. I appreciate you. 